The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. morning's message is rooted in God and very often Jennifer likes to review the church with how to deal with root issues Um, because we want to move forward and upward in the things of God we want to grow we want to mature but the term rooted in God uh, Ephesians 3 17 says that Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded So you're both a building and a plant, okay? Uh, Rooted and grounded in the love of God. Well, 1 John 4, 8 says God is love. So to be rooted in God, you're rooted in love. You're rooted in His nature. And uh, I think before I get into a little bit of what what bitter roots are, uh, I just felt uh, one morning I got up and just like the Lord was saying, we need a review on the essence of God. If you're going to get rooted in God, we ought to know a little bit more about what does that look like? What does God say he, who does he say he is, right? What, if we're going to be rooted in him, what is, his, what is attributes of his divine nature that we're to be rooted in? And <clears throat> the thing that uh, I got, and I want to review real quick, uh, <laughs> real quick, uh, when I say that, that's evangelistically speaking, uh, <laughs> Quick might be a little bit long, but anyway, there's always there's always time for a part two, all right? So I'm going to go slow, but uh, here's the thing. And and I woke up, I was half awake, and I went into prayer, and it was like God just uh, reminded me that light. You might want to write this down. Light, life, and love. Three very simple words: light, life, and love. And scripturally, that is the essence of God. God is light, God is life, and God is love. But it's it's opposed to the natural realm. By the natural realm is we have natural light, we get it from the sun. But that's not the light that he's talking about in his divine nature. Uh, Life, we have biological life. But that's not the life he's talking about. He's talking about the Zoe, the God kind of life. The life that can only come from him. And love, uh, you know, one of the most beautiful things the world has is a mother's love. But you don't have to be a Christian to have mother's love. And it's a beautiful thing to watch. But it's not going to get you to heaven either. So there's agape love. The love that comes from God. And so... These three elements, light, life, and love. Uh, And God taught me as a young Christian, before I got really any schooling, he took me to the school of the Spirit, and in times of prayer, he said, whatever truth I give you, and truth, by the way, is synonymous with the word reality. Jesus is reality. Jesus is the truth. He doesn't just have truths. He is truth. And he is reality. So there's a, there's a realm there in the spirit of reality that a non-believer, matter of fact, Corinthians says, you know what a non-believer would call it? Foolishness. Because you can't define something you don't know anything about. And so anyone, it, a matter of fact, I had unsaved people say that. It's, it's, they came into a group of Christians and they were unsaved. And, they're, it is, and it's like, I thought the statement they made was very interesting. They said, it's like you people know something that I don't know. There you have it. It's like you, but that knowing is a supernatural awareness. That is a supernatural knowing. And they're right. Because the love of God surpasses your understanding. And they're trying with natural light, natural understanding, to perceive something that is spiritually discerned. So uh, if people think as a believer you've entered into a reality with Jesus 
and uh, they think it's foolishness. I'm, I'm not even surprised. Matter of fact, I'm surprised that non-believers aren't worse. You know, some people get so offended by people all the time. I'm going, well, if they're unsaved, they're just acting like unsaved people act. I mean, I, I never got the overreaction. I can remember in my first church when I was a young pastor, I had some people go into a, 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 a real desperate area and they handed out food. And I had a couple people come back insulted that when they handed the food out, the people weren't grateful and thankful. Instead, they said, what else have you got? <laughs> and they were offended. <laughs> it's like, you know what? It's going to be the time when offenses will come, but woe are you if you, you, you're, you're one of the initiators of it. Unsa I'm surprised unsaved people aren't worse. So when an unsaved person acts like an unsaved person, you are supposed to respond, not react. That's the character. And God wants us rooted in light, life, and love. And here's the thing. God said, all right, Dennis, I'm going to take you to the school of the Spirit, and you're going to understand that there's three realms. And he, he brought this up Tuesday night to me as well. In the garden, there was two trees, but three realms. Say that back to me. Two trees, three realms. What were those three realms of the two trees? Well, there was the tree of life in the midst of the garden, but there was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we're living in a time when the church is going to have to be more discerning in the spiritual realm and not just lean on their own understanding. Because in that realm, there is God's realm, the tree of life, but there's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And what works on Christians even the best, and on non-Christian, what works on them is evil disguised as good. But good is not necessarily God. Are you with me on that? So, in cultivating, God says, any truth that I give you. Now, when God gives me a truth, what's, what's the sana? Uh, you can change that word truth to Jesus and reality, either one. All right? He is the truth. He doesn't just have truths. It's not just facts. It's reality. And God says, I will give you a truth or light, but the light he's talking about is revelation light, right? And it's really the way he expresses truth is the light bulb goes on, <laughs> so to speak, right? How many, all of us, how many of you in your Christian walk have discovered from time to time through the scriptures, all of a sudden you, you got a aha moment. That is supernatural light and the non-believer doesn't know what you're talking about. You have an epiphany, you have an insight. But that is God's way of revealing truth. Light is the way he reveals reality. Life is the way he expresses his truth or his reality. And so truth or that reality, that aha moment, needs to take the next step. And God says, I'm going to teach you, Dennis, how to cultivate. Because now you had an aha moment. You just don't go broadcast the aha moment. You're really supposed to cultivate. In other words, you're, you're to make it part of your life, not just lip service to it as exciting as it might be, but you're to cultivate that into your life. And then, how do I know if something has been cultivated in my life? The third element is fruit. All right? So I want to kind of move in that direction because what I see is these three elements, light uh, and actually grace. Grace, and the best definition, is not just unmerited favor because that can be misused. Grace is the personal presence of Jesus, of love himself, enabling you, and that's empowering you, empowering you to be and to do all that he called you to be and all that he called you to do. So it's the empowerment, for it is God who is at work in you, 
both to will and to perform. Grace is his divine enablement. And I can remember John Bevere uh, did that, that research and was appalled throughout the church uh, across all denominational lines, people were asked to give a definition of grace um, and only 2% were able to give a definition of grace that involved empowerment or enablement. Grace is the ability to not sin. Grace is the personal presence of Jesus changing you, causing you to walk in His statutes. And 2% had an empowerment. All the rest was, it's free. And it was when you got saved. It was a free gift. You were saved by faith through grace. And it was the gift of God. Didn't require anything on your part except to receive it as a gift. But once you enter into it, it says Jesus himself was full of grace and truth. So grace is the way love gets expressed to us. Truth, or reality, is the way light is expressed to us. That aha moment, that insight, that understanding that comes from the spirit and informs the brain rather than the brain through intellect figuring it out. Okay? So, I looked at this, and here's what I believe God is saying. He's going to say, we're, we're going to encourage a people to learn to discern, discern in three realms. Because the easiest way to fool a Christian is to give them something good. You know, the devil isn't going to th flaunt evil in your face if he can show you something good that's not God. Wouldn't that be the better strategy? Really. Flattery. Compliments. A lot of that can be sound good. But a discerning person in three realms has to know the source. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. But the power of the tongue is not just the words themselves, it's what's behind the words. Have you ever had somebody flatter you and it wasn't, didn't feel clean? Ladies, come on. That's a nice dress. And yet you felt like, <laughs> I wish they would have said nothing. Because quite frankly, there could have been jealousy behind it. There could have been, the motivation behind the word is what is that word rooted in? Where there's fruit, there's a root, right? Now, I want to give you this verse of Scripture that the Lord quickened to me. And I love this stuff when He quickens to me. I have my aha moment when I'm still waking up and haven't had my coffee. That's when I know it's God because I get all excited. I'm, going, I'm really excited. Oh, wow, that's a good Scripture, but I think I better get my coffee. <laughs> all right, but here's, here's what He quickened. In Matthew 7, verses 15 to 20, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. Inwardly, they're ravenous wolves. In other words, they want to devour. What would be another thing? They have an agenda. We have a series called Deadly Agendas. All right? And they can look good on the surface, can't they? You will know them by their fruit. Ah, so it's time for us to be fruit inspectors. Do you know you're allowed to be, you're not supposed to be, judge people into the level of condemnation, but you are to be fruit inspectors, right? In other words, if God gives a truth and that truth is cultivated in your life, you should be honest enough to see whether or not there's fruit. Because where there's fruit, there's a root, good or bad. Where there's fruit, there's a root. So now it says, you will know them by their fruit. Men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles. Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown to the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Now, when it comes to being rooted in God, which, which we want to get to, and I want to do some ministry this morning too, so I hope you're willing to run up here and get some. All right? First, I have to get you convicted somewhat, at least a little bit. All right? Just to stir your interest. But in Isaiah 9... 
A people who sit in darkness have seen a great light, and those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. A people who sit in darkness have seen a great light. Now, obviously these people were not sitting in blackness of the sky, right? They're talking spiritual darkness. They had sunshine <laughs> and darkness in the standard daily uh, routine, but they sat in darkness, meaning it was an absence of the kind of light that God's talking about. And it was prophesying even to the coming of the Messiah, who is light. Jesus, he said, I am the light of the world, right? Interestingly enough, and this is what we want to deal with today a little bit, light has come into the world, but people love the darkness. Why? Because their deeds were evil, and light has a tendency to expose bad motives, agendas, evil, even the kind that looks good. That's why we want the light. We want to be so grounded in the light of God, the love of God, and the life, L-I-F-E. That's life, Zoe life. That's the God kind of life. That's the kind of life you can only get. This is eternal life, John 17, 3. This is eternal life that they know me. Apart from intimacy with God, you don't know what life is all about. You only know biological life. So God says, <clears throat> and I like this, a people who walked in darkness have seen a great light they that dwell in the land of the shadow of death upon them a light has shined prophesying years in advance i think it's something like 600 years in advance of the messiah coming who says i am the light of the world now darkness can't extinguish it or understand it so then again if you have light that's coming from god a revelation of the word which he is the word in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. All right, so you have a revelation of the Word. It's very clear that some people are not going to understand, but they can't put it out. You can't extinguish that light. And like the little kids saying, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. They, they can't extinguish something because a little bit of light shines in the midst of darkness. Darkness can't extinguish it. Ephesians 5 talks about believers. You were once in darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. So continue to walk as children of light, as sons and daughters of the Father of lights. All right? But understanding, <clears throat> and I already said this, but being full of grace and reality, full, full of grace and truth, Jesus himself was full. Grace and and this is worth writing down because I think sometimes you get that word grace. Oh, think so. Grace is the love of God being expressed through you, to you and through you. Reality is that light being expressed, the expression of light, reality or truth. And remember, reality and truth are interchangeable. Remember Pontius Pilate asking Jesus, well, what is truth? Because he wanted to get philosophical, which is what a non-believer would do. What is truth? Probably prided himself in his, all the studies of philosophy. And Jesus, of course, I am the way the truth, and the life. I don't just have some, I am. Hmm? No. In him was life, and this life was the light of men. There you go. Like I said, the love, light, and life are pretty much interchangeable because they are all the essence of what God is. So if we're going to get rooted and grounded in God, we get rooted in light, life, and love. Correct? Then you're rooted in God. I think it's important, before we talk about roots, we ought to know what God is so that when we're rooted and grounded in Him, we know what should be coming forth from us. 
In other words, if it's being cultivated in us, if he's revealed the truth to us, it should be expressed through us as fruit. Now, didn't he say, I came that you might have life, that you might have it more abundantly? What kind of life was he talking about? Not natural life. Although it will affect your natural life. But he's talking about eternal life. And this is eternal life, that they know me intimately through divine, intimate connection. And this not you don't know him here. You know him here. Now, I came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And if that power that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he will give life to your mortal body. We wrote a book on uh, releasing the divine healer. And really what we do is, I have resurrection life in me. So do you, if you're born again. We would, we would soak in the presence of God and welcome that divine healer into every cell of our physical body, into every organ, into every part of us, and just enjoy that welcoming. Because if that power that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in me, he's going to give life to my mortal body. You know what mortal body means? It's doomed to die. Mortal. Your death-doomed body. <laughs> but he gives life to that death-doomed body. So I'm going to go, have your way, God. Open ye gates, let the King of glory, let the God of healing flow into every cell of my physical body. I remember, I was, I, even as a baby Christian, I, I read somewhere where not all of your brain cells are being used, and I'm going, what a waste. Lord, go into all those dead areas and give me wisdom and revelation. <laughs> all those areas that aren't doing anything. I want to be a good steward of the grace of God, so therefore, any cells in my brain that are not being occupied properly, occupy them, would you? Open ye gates, let the King of Glory come in. And on every cell on your physical body, there are gates and channels. Isn't that interesting? And that's why your toxic emotions actually can suck inside the cell. You can actually draw it in like poison. So if I'm going to open my gates. I want to open my gates to the presence of God. I want to open my gates to the healing. I want to open to light, life, and love. Right? The very essence of God. Now, <clears throat> love, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and against such there's no law. There's no law because this is the law of life that sets us free from the law of sin. Now, we've done this before, but it's important to know that the fruit of the Spirit is basically manifestations or the way fruit manifests in different aspects of everyday life. But there's really only one fruit, and it's love. Joy is love rejoicing. Don't you like that? Joy, and you should be able to feel joy, by the way, not like some theologians. I got the joy of the Lord by faith. I don't know about you, but I don't want that kind of joy. I want the joy that God gave me emotions to experience the supernatural emotions or fruit of the Spirit. I've got the joy of the Lord. I want to touch joy. I want to feel joy. And quite frankly, even when I'm talking about it, some of you are getting triggered in your gut, and it's like putting a smile on your face. That's not just happy. That's bearing witness in your spirit to the joy that's in there. That functions regardless of circumstances or people. Regardless of my message, whether it's good or not, you can still have joy. <laughs> Isn't that good? Regardless of whether people like you or not, you can still have joy. It functions independent of people and circumstances. Peace is the love of God, and it's really twofold. Peace is love resting, but it's also ruling. Let the peace of God rule. When you remain at rest, you're also in a place of entering into the rest of faith, but you are also in the place of great authority. For the God of peace can crush Satan beneath your feet. So peace, patience is love enduring. When God taught me patience, it was, uh, Dennis, uh, you take uh, your timetable off of that situation. Uh, I always wanted everything yesterday. <laughs> and he says, open your heart and keep your heart open. And that's 
Patience is holding the heart open till love comes through. Love never fails, so love's going to come through. But his time's not my time. I want it, always want it faster. Always. And guess what? He has the last word, and it's going to be his time, not my time. So I'm better off cultivating the fruit of patience by just holding my heart open and saying, love never fails, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait upon the Lord. Now, I'm going to go through these kind of quick. Kindness is love in acts of caring. It translates into action, the fruit of caring. One time we had a, we had a visiting uh, person in our neighborhood, uh, a relative of our neighbor, and I want to tell you something. By discernment, she was mean as a snake, and she showed it on her face, too. And I got such a kick out of it because uh, she came out of the house. I went, oh, it was, like, it was like a bear came out of the woods hungry. And she came out of the house, went to the mailbox, and Jennifer runs <laughs> and gives her a big hug. I go, that's the fruit of kindness. <laughs> I thought, oh, was this. And the funny thing is, she got that lady to smile. So who knows how superior the fruit of God's essence is compared to some sourpuss, right? Why don't you try it this week? Make somebody smile, especially if they look a little down in the mouth, all right? Goodness is love motivating. In other words, goodness, remember we said everything that's good is not necessarily God, but God is good. Remember even Jesus says, why do you call me good? Only God is good. Are you calling me God? It's really what he's saying by implication. Interesting. All right, if God is good, so then you could have an agenda and look good, but what's coming out is not God. Goodness is when your motive is pure, when your motive is not to get something. Faithfulness is love trusting. I like uh, when the Lord taught me trusting, he always used Proverbs 3, 4, and 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not. And, but I, I'm visual, so here's the way I saw that. Trust in the Lord. Trust. Let go. Yield. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Now that includes your mind, will, and emotions. All of your heart. Lean not on your understanding, but acknowledge. Acknowledge is not up here. See, my first thought was acknowledge Him in all your ways. No, no. Acknowledge is through divine, intimate connection. And He will direct your path. We've got to learn to live more from the gut. You don't throw this out, but the two need to work together to where if your gut's telling you something like, don't do that, by the way, your conscience is down here, and it goes up and informs your head. So if you get a, that means don't do it. <laughs> or at least rethink it or wait. It's kind of like a yellow light. Maybe it's not bad, but maybe now is not the time. Were you, ever, were you ever in a group, and people were talking, and you wish someone would shut up? Don't do that now. <laughs> Did you? Did you ever wish someone would shut up? Huh? You know what that is? Their timing is off. They're into self at that point, and they're not aware of the corporate setting. I did that as a young, uh, young believer. I used to do that in every prayer meeting. Every prayer meeting. The pastor would start to talk, and I would add something to what he was saying. I always had something to add. But every time I added that I thought it was so anointed, down here it would go, <clears throat> until eventually I learned that meant I was out of time. It wasn't that what I said wasn't bad. It was like, you got to learn to rule your spirit. For he that ruleth his spirit is greater than the mighty. <laughs> rule your spirit means, and that's another fruit of the spirit, it's called self-control which means love is controlling you, not your um, 
what would you call it? Not, not adrenaline. And how many people, and I even ran into preachers, that adrenaline they considered anointing. No, anybody can have adrenaline rush. That is not necessarily the anointing. Meekness. Meekness is when you don't fight or argue or rebel against the people and circumstances that are taking place in your life. Meekness is you're looking out for the interest of others more than yourself. Most good that's not God motivation is looking out for what you want or an agenda. I can remember people coming to the church and uh, they didn't care about any of these people. They didn't care about building a relationship. They came in and they said, uh, I'm an organ player, and they don't have an organ. I'm out of here. That's an agenda. Is it a good agenda that they're an organ player? Well, perhaps. But I think they ought to find out what God wants because they're looking around with an agenda and evaluating based on that. That's not God. That's good, but it's not God. Being an, playing an organ is not a bad thing. My favorite one was the when my first church is I had the six teenage boys come and they all came and they're going like, oh, we're hungry for God. They look around, but there's no girls. The following week, there was no guys and there was a half a dozen girls came and there's no guys. I'm going, that is the story of your life when you have an agenda. It will not work out. You'll always be in the wrong place at the wrong time because your heart isn't pure. You have an agenda. Now, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. Actually, righteousness is love and action. So the kingdom, the invisible kingdom that we as believers are supposed to be involved in, to let that kingdom rule is love and action, peace, and joy. Actually, that's all the fruit of the Spirit. Without the fruit, you can talk kingdom, you can talk theology, but unless there's a manifestation of the fruit, what good is it? All right? Okay, I went easy so far. You ready for the hard part now? Now we're going to mess with you. All this was easy. All of this was like working into it. Oh, gee, maybe it was an agenda. Oh, no. <laughs> I... <laughs> want to cover... Something that changed more people in our church than anything else. And I mean people that had studied our material, had studied different things. Um, but the light bulb really went on. What would we call that light bulb? Light. The very essence of God revealing truth. You know what topic it was? Bitter roots. Bitter roots. Where is that in the scripture? Hebrews 12. Verses 14 and 15. This is worth writing down. Because remember, we're saying we want uh, Christ to dwell in our hearts through faith so that we'd be rooted and grounded in love, and God is love. All right? Hebrews 12, verse 14 and 15. Those of you who are watching on YouTube, and especially all the people that take notes at home, You'll want to watch this twice to get the issues really down pat so that it facilitates a supernatural exchange inside of you or change or transformation. All right? Pursue peace with all men and holiness. Pursue peace with all men and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that none of you come short of the grace of God. Remember, he's full of grace and truth. You have to pursue holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that you don't come short of the grace of God. So how do I become short of the grace of God? Grace is available all the time. But it says the one thing that can short circuit the grace is bitterness or unforgiveness in your heart. 
judgments. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many are defiled. Because judgments sprout like poisonous weeds in the furrows of the field. That's Hosea 10.4. You can add that one. Judgment springs up like poisonous weeds in the furrow of the field. All right, A bitter root springs up, causes trouble, and many be defiled. This is something I've watched in 45 years as a pastor. I've seen it over and over and over again. Where there's fruit, I'm talking bad fruit. Where there's bad fruit, there's a root. Plain and simple. And it says, when it springs up, it causes you trouble. So even if you're selfish at this point, it causes you trouble, get rid of it. But the part that really is disturbing, it causes you trouble, but it defiles others. I knew a woman who was married to an alcoholic, had such bitterness toward him, got divorced, but then, interestingly enough, started dating a man who had no alcohol problems, and she pushed him to drink. Is that possible? It springs up, causes you trouble, but it defiles others. You can actually push people to sin against you. They're, all, they're, they're, they're responsible for their own sin. But you can be part of the process of pushing somebody into something. But if you deal with the root, you won't see the fruit. If you see a recurring pattern in your life, that same old, same old, I promise you, it is not other people, and it's not the world, and it's not the church, and it's not God, it's not the neighborhood, it's not the school, it's you. If you see a repetitive pattern where there's a fruit, there is a root, a repetitive pattern. We used to call it the same old, same old. Everybody that has a same old, same old, you say, my life is going really good, except there's this one thing that every so often pops up. Well, it springs up and it causes you trouble, right? But it not only causes you trouble, it pushes other people to act accordingly. The most horrible illustration was Jennifer telling me, and it's true, you don't like to talk about it, but uh, she was a uh, school psychologist. Uh, and she would deal with children that were abused uh, and the ones that were physically abused, the sad part is, she said, their behavior, that's why uh, abused very often become abusers. Did you know that? Yeah. That's a root. But she says, the sad part was, as a Christian even, she said, the ones that were abused, she said, their behavior pushed you to where you wanted to smack them. And then be horrified that the thought even entered your head. But that is a spiritual principle of sowing and reaping. And you may not like the law of sowing and reaping, but I'm sorry, it operates in the natural and in the spirit. What you sow, you will reap. You don't have to like the law. You don't have to like gravity. You walk off a cliff, it's going to prove itself. You don't have to agree with it. You don't have to like it. But sowing and reaping. Jesus himself said, if you don't understand sowing and reaping, if you don't understand this, how will you understand anything in the Bible? Well, he said, how will you understand any of it? Because it's like the, 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 the top of supernatural principles, sowing and reaping. Now, if... A tree is identified by its fruit. If the tree is good, the fruit will be good. If the tree is bad, the fruit will be bad. A bitter root forms when a toxic emotion is planted in the heart. Now, we call it a root of bitterness, but it can be anger, it can be bitter, it can be 
a shame that can be hurt, fear, lust, anger, guilt, shame. But remember we said that it gets planted in the heart so that emotions don't die. They get buried alive. So what do even Christians do? Suppress it. But what gets suppressed, this, this is a law whether you like it or not, whatever gets suppressed will get expressed eventually. And probably that eventually will be at some time that you wished it didn't. It'll, worse, it's, it happened in public now. I acted like a total idiot. All right? Or I acted in front of my family. All right? You might have had a judgment against your mother-in-law and she comes and cooks a dinner for you and you go, that? I don't want that. I hate that. Oh my God, what did I say? The issue wasn't the dinner. The issue was in you toward your mother-in-law. Does that make sense? <laughs> it springs up in you and causes you trouble and then defiles others. You know what? I, if I was the mother-in-law and she did that after I brought her dinner, I'm like, oh, well, that's the last time I'm bringing dinner here. It's like... Right? So you defile them, or you get them to say, wow, that daughter-in-law of mine, <laughs> she's a piece of work. You just defile them. Now, is she responsible for that statement? Yeah, she has to stand before God for that statement. But nonetheless, you helped it along, didn't you? You pushed the buttons, didn't you? Remember the person that goes to the psychiatrist and they go, I don't understand it. My mother pushes my buttons. Psychiatrist, but that's because she installed them. She put those buttons in you. No, you put those buttons in you. Your bad response is what puts the button in. A root always produces fruit. You can identify a root by its fruit, and a bitter root comes as a result of our sinful reactions to people and circumstances. A tree is identified by its fruit. Now, I want to cover some of this and then we're going to pray. Uh, <clears throat> I want to pray for people individually because stuff will surface while I'm talking. What's a bitter root again? It's something that's been suppressed, that's not been dealt with. A lot of times because you blame them. The blame game isn't part of Christianity, I'm sorry. The blame game is unforgiveness being worked out in everyday life. <laughs> So, the first law is both natural and spiritual. And I would write these down, and if you're a note taker, this would be wonderful to do your homework. A law operates automatically. That's why you'll be surprised by some of your reactions to people and circumstances. A law operates automatically. And it produces results even if you don't know where there is a law or you don't believe it. <laughs> Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever sows, a man sows, he shall reap. So you don't have to believe in it. You don't have to know. But it's going to happen. It's a law. The second thing, and this is important, um, the law of increase. You sow a seed, you reap a harvest. So anything that's not dealt with grows. Now we want you to grow in the grace and the knowledge of God, but anything unresolved in you grows. You know, some of those serial killers, when they were kids, before they started on people, they tortured animals. They got their start somewhere, and then the law of increase. They wanted new horizons. So the principle of increase, it says that you can plow iniquity and sow wickedness, you will reap the same. They sow to the wind and they reap the whirlwind. You sow to the wind and you reap a tornado, the law of increase. Whatever you sow always produces a harvest, and the judgments that you sow in childhood, very often you don't reap them till adulthood. I wish I could take every church and just have a seminar on teaching believers to forgive themselves. If people would receive forgiveness, 
themselves and quit judging themselves, there would be a freedom from a lot of, uh, a lot of sickness and disease. You keep telling your body that I'm no good, I'm a bad person, your body's going to start believing it, your immune system is going to cooperate with it. Because we're like a closed unit. Everything is connected to everything. Spirit, soul, and body. They're all connected. You keep telling yourself that how dumb you are, how stupid you are, and uh, you're not worth living, and you, show, you have no right to this. You're, you're speaking to your own immune system. You're actually helping yourself, not instantly, but making yourself sick. Stop it! <laughs> That was a comedian's solution, right? He said, I could solve any problem. What was that, Bob Newhart? He said, for $5, give me $5, okay? What's your problem? Oh, I'm afraid of the dark and I can't go in the elevator. Stop it. That'll be $5, thank you. <laughs> and if, it, if that doesn't work, they, well, I'm afraid of confined places. I'm, sometimes I'm afraid uh, I can't go in an elevator. He goes, stop it. And she goes, no, it still didn't work. He goes, okay, I'm going to put you in a box and confine you. She stopped it. Five dollars. It's not that easy, is it? No, you actually have to identify it and give it to Jesus. All right. But judgments made against others boomerang back on us. So there's judging others. You who judge, you will do the same thing. Oh, as a pastor, pre-marriage counseling, and then they get married. Oh, my goodness. The guy says, you're just like my mother. You know what that tells me? He never dealt with the issues in his heart toward his mother because his wife may be nothing like his mother, but he'll see his mother in her. <laughs> if the heart is defiled, it's going gonna, it's gonna to push them. You might even push her to be like your mother. He's just like my father. Remember that time we did the BEH class, Jennifer? The BEH is um, Jennifer, I was the guest speaker, and Jennifer had the behavior problems, the ones that the teachers couldn't handle. They put them in a one room <laughs> and gave them to Jennifer. <laughs> and we saw, actually saw tremendous progress with that. But the one was we're, uh, 15 years old. Where do you think you're going to be? In the future, dead or in jail, that's where all my friends are, dead or in jail. And Jennifer got his name and he put it up in his cubicle, uh, Kevin, uh, person of kindness. And he crumpled that up. And Jennifer really milked it. She, she's bad. She goes, you mean in your whole life you never were kind even one time? All of a sudden, Mr. Kindness all these things pop. Well, there was a time a guy got a flat tire and he didn't know how to fix it, and I fixed it. And there was a time I did it. All of a sudden, Mr. Kindness was living up to his name. But he, he reacted violently when we said the law of relationship, boys, the things you judged your fathers for, you will do the same thing. They hate, he hated that. He burst out into a temper tantrum right in the room and then got Jennifer on the side after class even. Is that true? Because I hate my father. You who judge, you will do the same thing. And the funny thing is, I watch people who think they can do a good version of it. Like, my father was uh, an alcoholic, selfish, so I won't drink. I'll just be selfish. You can't trick the system, in other words. Sowing and reaping works. But you can, oh, my parents were so strict, I'll be lenient. <laughs> we'll see how that works. I'll do the opposite of what they did rather than dealing with the root issue in me. The root issue is unforgiveness lodged in the heart. And just because you forgot about it doesn't mean it's not working. That's the way the law of Sowing and reaping works. It works in you whether you forgot about it or not. So I would say, God, search me, O God, for anxious thoughts and hurtful ways. That's what David did. David says, search me for secret faults. I don't even know what they are. But I'm opening myself up to the only one I do trust is the wonderful counselor. Not a counselor, 
the wonderful counselor. I open up and say, search me, O God, for anxious thoughts and hurtful ways. Because you who judge, you will do the same thing. So there's the law of sowing and reaping. These are laws of relationship. The principle of increase, sow a seed, reap a harvest. The third law is judging others. You will do the same thing. Girls, the things you judged your, <clears throat> your fathers for, you will reap through a husband. And a lot of times it doesn't click in until adulthood and you get married. Now what do they say? My father was like that. I'm not putting up with that. Well, maybe there's something in you that springs up that causes you trouble. You know, when we do uh, ministry here, we teach uh, a man and a woman, you deal with your suitcase and you deal with your suitcase. You brought suitcase into the marriage and you brought suitcase into the marriage. Stay out of the other one's suitcase. That doesn't fix anything. You deal with your own stuff. You get in somebody else's suitcase and you're over there looking around. Well, you know what your problem is. No, no, no. You just look at what your problem is. <laughs> right? All right. Honoring and dishonoring parents. That's the fourth element of the law of relationship. Honor your father and mother that your days may be prolonged and that life might go well with you. To the degree you don't honor mother and father, life's not going to go well. And you're going to say, wait a minute. You don't know what my mother and father were like. It doesn't matter. Honor them doesn't mean honor their bad behavior. Honor them by releasing forgiveness to them. They may have done the best they could. And they may, you may be demanding and expecting something from them that they never got. How in the world were you expecting them to give it? Now, were you entitled to certain things? Yes. But that's the benefit of being a believer. Because whatsoever you needed and didn't receive, you can receive righteously from God. You didn't get security, peace. You didn't get affirmation. You can get that directly from God. But it's not going to flow into your life until you release the demand and the expectation and the judgments that you had on them. You who judge, you will do the same thing. I don't think we all like that sowing and reaping thing, right? It would be so much easier if we would just deal with our stuff. 60-day challenge, if it's properly done, people would deal with the vast majority of their stuff to where they could live in the here and now a lot more regularly. I don't know. After the 60 days of uh, ministering to Jennifer when we got married, going back to the past is very, very rare. Because if you're sincere, you deal with the garbage and in a couple of months, not years of ministry. That's nonsense. You know, if it takes years and years and years to deal with your stuff, you know what that means? There's a lot of flesh there. How about the person that says, I tried to forgive, but I'm stuck. In my mind's eye, I see Jesus who walks through walls, getting halfway through a wall and going, I'm stuck. No, if you're stuck, you know what that is? Your flesh doesn't want to. Part of you wants to, or you wouldn't have even bothered praying. But part of you don't want to forgive them. That's when you get stuck, because there's no such thing as stuck. Stuck simply means part of you don't want to. Why not agree with the new creation you that loves God, loves His Word, and just agree with that part and get unstuck and let God who is at work in you will and perform. Get out of the way and let Him do it. He will do what's too hard for you to do anyway. That's why the new creation has to do it. That's why when you forgive, it has to be from the heart. Because if you forgive from the head, it doesn't work. And how do you know if it doesn't work? There's no peace. All right. Now, without <clears throat> giving details, we're going to pray for bitter roots right here and for people watching on uh, YouTube, Facebook, whatever they're watching on. And you can do this without being embarrassed. You can do it right there in your seat. All you have to do is be honest with the Lord. You think we can do that? Go like this. I can do that. <laughs> and besides, Dennis won't know whether I'm doing it or not. <laughs> but God will, right? 
Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart, so he'll know what's going on on the inside. So, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I, I believe the Holy Spirit has popped up something that I've seen as a recurring. We're looking for recurring. Recurring patterns. It seems like it goes away for a while, but then all of a sudden, it pop, there it is, pops up again. That same old, same old. Nod your head if you've got a same old, same old. You can picture a same old, okay? Then here's what you do. You picture that same old, same old, and then you say, God, search me. Where did that get started? Because where there's a root, it got started somewhere. Where did that get started? Nod your head when you see something. Even if you can't explain it, don't worry about it. Just, a lot of times it's something that happened in childhood even. Okay? Then whatever popped up has a feeling attached. Every thought, every memory is in feeling thought bundles. Down in your gut, present that yucky feeling, present it to Jesus, the forgiver, and let forgiveness go in two directions. One, I release forgiveness to any person that was involved. Releasing forgiveness does not exonerate them from their sin. It, it frees you from the control of it. I release out of my belly flows a river of loving forgiveness flowing out to them. Now here's the mature thing to do. I also, it's like drinking in. It's just like getting, when you got saved, you invited him in. And well, he's already in there. Now I yield to the Jesus, the forgiver in me, and I receive forgiveness for knowingly or unknowingly having allowed that to harbor in me all this time. I receive forgiveness for knowingly or unknowingly allowing that to be a kind of poison on the inside of me. And when you receive forgiveness and you release forgiveness, there's a supernatural transaction that takes place that produces peace. That's your internal way, and those of you who are watching by video, this is your internal way to know if you did it right. Because people always say, how do I know if I did it right? Peace. Peace is the evidence that the grace of God provided a supernatural exchange. That's why the Bible says forgive from the heart because many people forgive from the head and the yuck is still there. If the hurt, fear, lust, anger, guilt, shame is still there, you forgave sincerely from the head, but that's not sufficient. It's got to be God who is at work in you to will and to perform. He's going to do it. He did it to you and now through you. Forgiveness is flowing out of my innermost being toward that individual. I'm receiving forgiveness. You know, there's even some people that they blame God. God didn't do nothing wrong, but you know what? For some, I released that judgment that I made against God. I made a judgment against God. Why did God let that happen? I'm not going to be free from the reaping until I release God of that judgment as well. So forgiveness can flow in three directions, God, self, and others. And God didn't do anything wrong, but you have to release that judgment you made against him. Okay. I'm going to walk you through one more time. It's for the benefit of the people go, I didn't get it, I didn't get it, I'm going to have to watch that again, I'm going to get it. Okay, just slow down. If you try hard, you actually abort it. Don't try, yield, surrender. Trust the God in you to do the work, okay? We can even do it this way too. A pet peeve. You have a pet peeve? 
You may have justified that pet peeve, but it's a bitter root. Nod your head if you've got a pet peeve. <laughs> uh, okay. That pet peeve? Holy Spirit, where'd that get started in my life? When did that get started? Because it bears fruit over the years. Bad fruit. A pet peeve, where did it get started? Well, I'm just going to release forgiveness to whoever. I release demands and expectations on people. I receive forgiveness for having harbored that all this time, knowingly or unknowingly. Emotions don't die, they get buried alive, and they affect your physical body. Toxic emotions are an indication that Jesus is not ruling in that area. Peace is the indication that Jesus is ruling in that area. I was listening to a policeman on television, and she said, it was a, a, a woman police officer, and she says, I have one pet peeve since I've been on the force. You know what it is? People that drive slow in the passing lane. If that was you, how would you deal with that? People, I can see myself someone driving 20 miles an hour in a 50 in the passing lane. <clears throat> I release forgiveness to them. I receive forgiveness for harboring such a feeling because I could justify it that I'm right. <laughs> I receive forgiveness, but I release them of demands and expectations. Whoa. Whoa. Because, you know, when you have demands and expectations, you're playing God. You're not general manager of the universe. God is. Some of us campaign occasionally, but God is the general manager of the universe, not us. Does that work? Got any pet peeves? You know how to deal with them then. They got started in there. Father, seal this work by the power of the Holy Spirit. May each and every person do their homework and deal with bitter roots because they'll spring up and cause them trouble and thereby push other people. You've been Jesus listening name. to Pastor Amen. Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.